Energy efficient LED lighting makes it feasible to grow produce right where people live and work. Stacking trays of plants vertically in a controlled indoor space increases production per foot dramatically, making it possible to produce year-round in large cities like Sydney, Australia, the home base of green space. With their innovative microfarm cabinets, green space takes the concept of growing local right to the consumer. Visually stunning, they are not just food but decor and provide fresh produce whenever needed without refrigeration. Greens are first planted at a central location. Once established, the seedlings are moved to micro farms located throughout the city. The cabinets are self-contained planters that ensure that greens have proper light, water, and nutrition. In May of 2023, grower Luke Rogers talked about the system to a group of students from Penn State. We're working off a hub and spoke model um, for distribution, which basically cuts out the supply chain. So we've designed um, what we call a micro farm. This is what we refer to as a macro farm. Um, the idea is that we can scale out, we can set up you know, a 100 or an 80 square meter macro farm and its sole purpose is to distribute directly to our micro farms. Um, a micro farm is basically a two meter by two meter tall cabinet, fully functional hydroponic system. Um, it's almost a replica of what you see here, albeit much smaller. The idea is that we can start the produce here, all the propagation's done here. We'd get to maybe two or three days off ready and then take the plants to the micro farm, at which point they can sit there grow as long as they, they need to. Um, and whoever that end user may be can harvest it fresh on site whenever they need it. Um, I think that's pretty key. Um, there's a lot of issues with distribution, particularly in Australia. There's you know, a lot of distance between most of the major cities, um, as well as regional cities for that matter. So for us to be able to come into the space and you know, activate a macro farm every for every 10k radius in a CBD, and then obviously maybe less so outside of the CBDs. Um, it's a really scalable model that you know, seems to work so far. I'd say February 2022 is when we started production here. Um, so we're a pretty new company. Um, this facility is strictly microgreens, in case you haven't um, figured that out just yet. Um, everything's quite young, everything's propagated here. Um, we do have another facility on the other side of the city that does edible flowers, um, and we do have a lot of plans to do a lot more. At the moment, we service wholesale and our own micro farms. Just this week, we hit 50, just over 50% went to the micro farms. Because of the, the hub and spoke model, we're trying to cut out you know, traditional transport from the supply chain. So we'll basically pack direct from the rack on site and then walk, walk the produce to where it needs to go. This is how you take it to your... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so look, there'll be some modifications um, moving forward, but we basically just found that the trays that we use fit perfectly in a, a, a gastro rack. A lot of pastry chefs use this kind of thing. Um, luckily for us, we could just buy them off the shelf and, and it worked. Um, so as we, as we expand, the idea is that a macro farm hub like, like we're in um, will be able to service, you know, this farm would probably do up, up to 70 micro farms um, and ideally they'd all be within, you know, maybe a 200 metre radius of, of this farm, at which point it's very easy just to walk the stuff up. Our customers love it, they love to tell the story, that's, you know, equally as important um, for them. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very exciting thing that we're trying to do here and I'm not sure about all of you but I haven't seen a similar model elsewhere just yet. As far as um, this facility goes, it's a fairly simple NFT system. Um, we have 12 production modules, um, a couple of R&D modules up the back. Um, each module is completely independent from the one next to it, which is fairly standard. Um, they're all IoT connected, so I can control pumps, lights, fans, humidity, um, every, everything else that goes into it remotely. 
We're also experimenting with some lettuce varieties in here at the moment, early days, as well as some Australian nat edible Australian natives, which is quite exciting. Uh, we can grow things about three times quicker than you can otherwise. Um, I guess a little bit about my background is I wasn't always in the vertical space. Um, I've, most of my career has been in polytunnels, glass houses, growing similar things. Um, but yeah, that was probably the number one difference is having the, the controls on you know, temp, humidity, lighting in particular, um, we can really boost production um, you know, more than what I actually thought would have been possible. I guess across over the 50 varieties we have, we're working off an average grow time in here of about 10.1 to 10.3 days. So it's a very quick turnaround. Um, can be cause trouble at times if we don't get things out exactly when they're ready. You know, like wheatgrass, red daikon, for example, we're looking at about, you know, it could be four or five days seed to sale. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty high turnaround type environment. Nothing sprayed in here at all, ever. Nothing actually touches the produce at all except water, and that's only really in the, the propagation phase. Um, we have had one pest outbreak in here before. I don't know how it happened, but we had some aphids pop up somehow. Um, but I've always used a biological approach to IPM, so we just released them. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, biological IPM a little bit, no? Um, basically, I'll rely on predatory bugs and beetles to handle pest outbreaks. So the aphids, for example, there's a particular wasp that is a natural predator of the aphid. Um, so I just buy them in, release them in here, sit back and let them, let nature take its course, which is, you know, a really interesting approach to IPM, I think, yes. What do you do about the wasps then? So, yeah, a lot of people ask that question. It's not this big, scary, stingy wasp. They're, you can barely see them, they're very small. Um, they'll basically parasitize the aphid, they'll lay eggs inside the aphid, their larvae will eat themselves out of the aphid, and then once the population kind of overtakes the pest, they'll just start to die off. And it's a pretty quick process. Most insect life cycles are very short, so that all might take place over the course of a week or so. I've used the same approach previously in other roles in you know, a more traditional sense. Um, being so enclosed just makes it easier because there's less you know, opportunity for more pests to come in, um, as well as the, the beneficial insects that you release have nowhere to go except you know, hunt down what they need to. What kind of substrate do you use to grow the produce, or is that another like secret thing? No, no, we use perlite at the moment. Um, basically, it works for our purpose. I'm not going to go and say I want to use it or I will use it. I'm looking into other things at the moment. Um, our goal is to basically make our, our pot or our end product as sustainable as possible. Um, obviously, the, whether it's biodegradable or not, but the plastic's an issue. Um, this is for wholesale. We have a different pot that we use for our micro farms, but the media as well. So I'm looking into a more sustainable option for media. Um, the perlite works well though for us at the moment, given that we're in, yes, it's a relatively controlled environment, but what I've found in when you kind of enclose everything quite a bit, everything sits a lot wetter than it normally would outside. Um, perlite dries out really quickly, which is awesome. I can cycle the pumps, I can get them to dry out, I can get that good root development, and then you get a more stable plant, which transports better. That's, that's the key. We, wanted to, we want to move away from the plastic, um, or any single-use plastic at all. Um, I tried biocane, I tried different versions of paper, I tried basically, you name it, I tried it. Um, nothing worked in our system. So we worked with a packaging manufacturer to develop a, a fully recyclable pot that is made out of 100% recycled material. So yes, it's plastic, but we basically created our own closed loop type system where we'll deliver the produce to the micro farms in those pots. We, we deliver every week, by the way. It's a weekly subscription-based model. Um, so the next week that we come to do the restock, we pick up the pots that we took the week before, we then sanitize them and then reuse them. Um, we're up to about 15 reuses at the moment. So that's been pretty successful. Um, 
although it is a lot of work to get them sanitized, cleaned, and ready to go, yes. Do you do your own research and development into how to create that uh, plastic pot better, or do you work with a partner who actually helps you with that? We work with a partner, yeah. So, look, we're a small team. Um, we are, I don't know if you technically or not, but we're basically a startup, so, you know, resources are limited. So wherever we can, we'll work with, with partners. Um, we're also working with a few people to build out our traceability systems. So the pot actually has a, all the pots have a QR code on them. Um, not fully utilised yet, but the idea is that further down the track, if you are to stick with it, um, an end consumer can scan the QR code and they'll know what farm the pot was propagated at, by who, when, how far it was transported, um, you know, some nutritional information. Whatever we can, can provide the end, end user, we will. So you, oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Um, do you power the lights with like solar panels or anything that's sustainable? Not at, not at this stage. Um, we have been selective in terms of where we've set up. So this building's a, a, a green rated six star building. So, <clears throat> so the whole building's run on renewable energy. Um, we do want to look at, at solar panels for power. We want to look at batteries in the micro farms. So basically take them completely off grid. Um, you know, wherever we can, we, we will. Yeah. Uh, for like the end users that are using your micro farms, how does your price point compare to like the grocery store? <coughs> it's, it's definitely higher, um, definitely. Um, but the reason for that is it's it, basically our subscription service is, is, how do I phrase it? It's a managed service that you're signing up for. It's not just the produce. So yes, the pot price will be higher, but within that, that pot, higher pot price, you have the unit cost, you have the weekly service, you have the additional pots. Um, we've kind of just wrapped everything up, similar to, I guess, a, a tech kind of um, subscription model, um, just to cover the costs and, and give the end user one sum to pay, as opposed to breaking it all up and convoluting things. On food waste in particular, um, with the micro farm distribution network, we kind of eliminate food waste for our particular product because we're basically working closely with whoever that end user may be, whether it's a chef or a, a corporate or whoever, um, so that when we come back to the micro farm, say we deliver 100 pots today, we'll come back next Friday, we'll get to the unit and it'll be completely empty because they have <coughs> utilised everything that we brought the week prior. Um, I've spoken to chefs and you know people in the catering industry and they tell me up, they get upwards of, well they waste upwards of 40% of what they actually buy. Everybody has a price for everything, so what price do you put on freshness? What price do you put on waste? I suppose I could assume that the price on waste is you know, 40% of what they've paid, given that's what they're throwing away. Um, so far, we have no waste out of our distribution network, um, which is, you know, pretty good. <laughs> that wasn't necessary at all, <laughs> but thank you.